Hello. Oh yeah, thanks. Welcome to the data science working group meeting for December 6th. As always, the meeting is subject to the chaos code of conduct. So please be kind to each other. Uh, the minutes, as I said, are in the chat. So have a look there. Tell us what the last thing that you ate was. We've got so we got some interesting stuff here. Oh, fudge. That's a, I, what I was saying earlier. It was like everybody's making me really hungry because dinner's not for probably an hour and a half by the time we get it made. So now I'm just now I'm just hungry. Um, okay. So as a reminder, chaos does take a little meeting break from the 10th of December through the 8th of January. So our next meeting is January 17th. So we do have a, a nice long break between, between topics. Um, we have a few things on the agenda. The first thing is the challenges survey analysis. Um, let me, oh, I, I linked to it, but let me, sorry. I'm not doing this very well. That's all right. We'll we'll go with it this way. No. Let me try that again. Oh, there, there we go. Okay. Um have uh, has everybody looked at at the challenges survey results? I have. I have. Okay, Sean has. There's a few few people uh, look like probably haven't. Um, so I'm going to go through them really really quickly. I would encourage you to have a look. The the repository that I linked to also has um, all of the text, the comments, which are interesting reading if you want a little more information. So I would encourage you to do that. I pulled out a few a few choice quotes, but I would encourage you to take a look at the, the data in more detail if you want to dig into it. But here are the key takeaways. Um, not surprisingly, installing our software continues to be the biggest challenge that people have with the chaos tools. Another challenge is actually finding the data that they want to look at and being able to draw insights from that data. So that's another challenge, which again is, is not particularly um, surprising, uh, given that we spun up this whole uh, data science position to help solve that problem. And then OSPOs continue to be important users of, of chaos tools, with a lot of them having used both tools at, at one point or, or another. We did get 31 people completed the survey. 26 of those people have actually used the chaos tools. Um, we do get a lot more usage or a lot more people completed the survey from for-profit companies. And a lot of them worked at in open source program offices. Um, I'm just gonna go through the demographics really quickly and then we can talk about the, the meat of it later. Um, a lot of the people are currently contributing to the project, some past contributors, and then a few people who've never contributed. So I think of these as probably more of the, the users of the software. And then we had a mix of positions. There really wasn't um, anything that, that stood out. There were some people in leadership positions, quite a few community positions, data, DevOps, and then a big other category that was um, like consultants and a few other miscellaneous, miscellaneous things. Um, so as I said, there were, I think 30, 31 people who completed the survey. Um, so a lot of people have used both of the tools. So you can see that's a little over 20 that have used Grimoire Lab, I think it's 21, 22, and about 16 have used Augur. Um, and then there are a lot of people, like I said, who've used both. And then there were some other and none that were other was things like like dev stats and some other metrics tools that aren't part of the chaos project. Um, and then, you know, there are a few that haven't really used our tools, but it was a, an interesting split. Uh, this is the more than three years was about a quarter of the people, a big chunk, one to two years, two to three years and less than a year. So we have people kind of all over the place um, within the chaos project. There wasn't a big, um, those didn't converge in any way. 
As I said before, OSPOs continue to be um, important users of our tools. So I excluded the other and none here on the software usage. And you can see the number of OSPOs that have used both, not necessarily at the same time, but at some point or another, they've actually used uh, both, of the, both of the tools. And stop me if you have any questions you wanna talk more. Um, but this is this is kind of the this is the big slide right here. This is the challenges slide. And so you can see each of the areas that we asked about. Um, we are not hearing the loud vacuum, Sean. I think you're good. Uh, as I said, installing our software continues to be the biggest challenge. So this is this is it right right here. You can see it's definitely the biggest um, red chunk. So the red is um, one is most challenging. Two is you know kind of a little less kind of medium, and then not least challenging is number seven. So I color coded those based on um, the the reds and the greens. So I hope nobody's colorblind and you can see these. But the installing configuring was definitely the, the biggest biggest chunk. And then the, the grays are NAs. So you can see that a lot of, there was also a pretty good chunk of people who don't install it. So they're probably either using um, some sort of SaaS solution or something like Baturgia, or maybe somebody on their team installed it for them. Um, and then you can see here, there are also some, pretty significant red and, and yellow chunks and being able to find the data and draw insights from it. Any questions or thoughts about any of any of this? Okay. Um, I did I did throw in some quotes. Um, I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to read these, but you can have you can have a look. Um, it's not the installation challenges are not limited to one or the other. It seems to be both of them. Uh, the hosting is difficult. Um, the tools are viewed as you know complex, which fair enough they are. Um, it's difficult to get started. And then you know one person said that getting either piece of software running locally proved impossible for them, which is uh, not entirely surprising. And then there were a lot of challenges around the insights. the The amount of data is overwhelming. It's hard to compare um, to compare repositories. Um, not all of the metrics are quantitative, so some of them require some manual examination, which is just the way that that communities communities work. Um, but it does make it challenging to draw insights from those, and then communicating them to the the C levels also perceived as a, a challenge as well. Um, and then there's also just some other things that kind of came up that it's hard to understand what is official chaos software because we also have things like OSS Compass, which are not official. Um, we have 8Knot, which is plugs into Augur. So that, you know, there, there are lots of bits and pieces that are used together. Some of them are chaos and some of them are not. And people are finding that confusing. Um, people find it hard to understand what we're actually about, uh, which is fair enough. We have, we have metrics definitions, we have software, we have context working groups, we have a lot of stuff going on and people find that difficult to navigate. So that's something to keep in mind as we, as we think about growing the community. Um, contributing has been challenging. Uh, the documentation has been perceived as incomplete and at times inaccurate. And then understanding the relationship between the software and the metrics can be difficult. So things aren't always named the same. Um, we haven't done a good job of connecting the software to the metrics definitions in the past. I know this is something that Sean's been working, working really hard to do within, within Augur, but that's been something that we haven't, haven't been great at. Um, and then on the positive side, people love us. Um, great community, described us as a family. Um, and so this was this was also really, really nice to see. A um, couple of caveats, a uh, small number of responses. We don't have a ton of users of our software to begin with. And then getting them to fill out the survey was um, was a challenge. But I feel like 31 was was pretty good given the size of the, the user base. Um, and then the survey was promoted pretty heavily within the chaos and to-do group communities, which might have influenced the number of, of OSPOs who responded. 
And then on the next steps, we're looking at more options for software as a service um, to make that easier for people to use. And then um, with the data science initiative, finding ways to help people use our metrics to gain, to gain insights into things that they can take action on is um, another, another next step. Okay, that was it. Any questions about this? Good job. Yeah, really good job. Thanks. All right, cool. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna call that call that bit done. Um, we have two other things on the agenda. So we have um, updates from the eight not team, and then we have Augur GraphQL update. So I'll turn it over to the uh, eight not folks. Do you want me to unshare so you can share your screen, or do you just want? Okay, perfect. I will do. Yeah, that. and okay. then wanted to ask people. Either people remember what the last thing they've seen and want me to go forward from there or just kind of do a starter demo of 8 not overall and then focus in on the new visualizations. If people have preferences, because I don't remember exactly where the last update I did with this group was. I think we have some, a couple of new people at least. So perhaps a brief sort of gestalt and then focus on the newer things. I don't know, what do you yeah. think? Yeah. Works. Okay, I'm going to put a couple of links in chat just to start off of here. The first one is the public instance of 8 knot, and then I'll also put in the repository for eight knot. And as um, Don had said earlier about kind of the relationship with eight knot to chaos overall is that Augur, it can kind of be viewed as like eight knot is a front end to Augur, from which we plug in directly to an eight knot instance if you we have a publicly hosted version of eight knot, but you can host your own version of eight knot and plug it into the Augur database that you have just by putting in the credentials. We have all the documentation of how you would set that up for yourself. And so that's kind of the background of how those two things are connected. And then I'm just going to share my screen and start just walking through things. I'm going to be sharing a like local instance of 8 not because we have a lot of stuff that is on our dev branch. So that's the one that we recommend people using if they're running locally. Dev is just a little bit ahead of main. We have a lot of pretty major updates that are happening on the back end that is making it to where our hosted instance is a little bit behind on a lot of the visualizations that we do have available. But that's all wrapping up right now. If you look at a lot of the PRs that we got going on. So let's see. I don't. Hopefully, I don't use um, Zoom that much. So, so this is the eight knot application. This is our welcome page. It has all of the details of the different pages, what they're supposed to like, what their purposes are, how the app is set up, and a few different tabs to help you use the application including how to use Plotly figures to do some nice little kind of their built-in functionality, how to make an Augur login because in these, you're able to plug it into your Augur instance or our, our publicly hosted one. You can log in, make your own user groups. And so you can see collections of repositories without having to select them each time. And that's also a way to trigger collection for new repositories if it's not already in the Augur instance that you're using for 8 not, or specifically our Augur instance for the public version. Um, so yeah, that's kind of our overall page. And then we can start to go into some of the newer visualizations. Actually gonna, we'll start with some of the newer ones quickly and then kind of go into some of the ones I think people are gonna find more exciting. Um, a couple of the visualizations we've started making is looking at reviewer information around PRs, trying to look at different levels of assignments and who are being assigned PRs. In the public instance, those contributor IDs are going to be hashed. But if you have your own instance, you just change out a comment and then that's going to be a login. 
we're just at this point not putting any individual identifiable information on our public instance. So that's another one of the good ones. And then another, we have a issue version of these as well. And then we have our um, PR time to first response. This is actually directly from a chaos visualization of allowing the user to be able to see how, with how many PRs are open, how many of them have a first response within a defined amount of days. And so we actually have another visualization and I'll show it at the end if we have time where it takes this and kind of takes it a step further and shows not even just the first response, but seeing if users or not even users, but if PR creators are getting responses by other people within a defined like time interval. So not just looking at that first comment, but looking at how your review process is going throughout the entire lifespan of a, of a PR. And so those are some of your more specifics, like in the weeds, looking at activity in the repositories. And these have been the big ones that we've been working on and I've been kind of alluding to for a while, which are the is the contributor heat map series. Right now, also for context, we have just the entire chaos org in our search bar. And so I'm going to just look at Augur because that's always my um, demo app um, repository. And so these visualizations, you're not looking at it at a search bar organizational level. You're looking at it from a repo level. And so that's why you have to go here and kind of select one. So we're going to be looking at Augur and just looking at the top level directory. And so what this visualization is, it's actually going to be a series of three heat maps. We're waiting on some stuff from Augur to be able to do the third one. But this first one is looking at for the entire directory or whatever folder you choose that you want to look at. How long has it been since people who have contributed to those folders or those files been active in any part of the repository? This actually came up from some conversations with Josh Berkus around trying to understand knowledge retention, not just at a project wide level, but looking at it more granularly of being able to understand, okay, is there sections of our code base that if something is there before PRs get stacked up or before there is some type of bug happening, is there knowledge that people who are active in our community that know and are familiar with these files or folders? And if not, what can we do preactive in a proactive manner to make sure that that knowledge base is there so the PRs don't add up, so that there isn't a bug on an area of code that nobody is familiar with that is active. So that's this first one. I'll kind of take a pause. I've said a lot of words very fast. I have, so question, comments, anything else before I kind of go any further? I think this is really cool. I, I really, I really like this particular graphic, the contributor file heat map. Um, yeah. It might also be good if you could have the file names on both ends of the graph mm -hmm. because the the rows are or the yeah the, the rows are so long it's kind of hard to hard to map that to the other side. Yeah, actually, I'm curious to see if the um, at least uh, yeah. Oh, if you mouse over it, you can see it. Oh yeah, that's another thing. Yeah. And um, the hover, all of these graphs have hover information. I should have kind of specified it a little bit. All of them have hover information. If there's different hover values that would be useful, open an issue or just let me know now, as well as all of these graphs have pretty much pretty detailed explanations of what is this showing, what data goes into it, how to kind of interpret what you're looking at. Um, and so those are kind of two, those are along the lines of some of the stuff that Plotly is able to give in that function, just kind of built-in functionality. So yeah, that is one of the good things. If you kind of go all the way over here, you can see which entry it is. See if there's anything. Oh, is there something in chat? Oh, sweet. Sweet. There's no more other questions on this one. I'll go down to our the next heat map that we've made, and I'm going to move over to the Augur one as well because I know there's some data in there. Um, 
This one is looking at the heat map from a contrib um, contribution standpoint. So we're looking, you need to look at it from how many PRs have been opened on either the files or the folders or how many PRs have been merged. And so it's the same kind of heat map concept. You have your um, files and folders are the, um, I guess this is like the y-axis. Yeah, the y-axis line and then how many PRs or have been opened or closed in each of the time buckets. So this had the same title as the one above it, I think. So this one, yeah, this is contributor and this is contribution. Okay. Gotcha. And so if there's other naming stuff that makes it a little bit easier, please let me know. This is these heat maps are from like a language standpoint is something that like James and I have been talking about a lot is that we think they're really useful, but getting across to people what they're actually showing and meaning because it's kind of like once you get it, it's like, oh, I see what's going on. I think it's pretty digestible, but getting to that first like, oh, like kind of the moment of, of it all coming together is difficult to do from a title and it's even more, it's like difficult even to do from a long form like graph info. Oh description this comes up when i'm explaining uh, eight not graphs and you know there's always the about graph that explains it really well and i think part of me is like that's the appropriate place for it in a web and part of me is an academic paper boy who knows that he has to provide thorough captions in line for people yeah. to see and it's like they are real web design and my captioning sense is in conflict. I don't have an answer. I'm just, I'm recognizing that's kind of part of the issue because contributor and contribution are the right words for those things. Yeah, but it's so easy. I mean, I feel like in a lot of different categories, I'm struggling to get people to read. Whether this, it, it shows up a lot in 8 not, and overall, whenever it comes to providing analysis is there's like it's a certain level of like I write all of these things I'm like okay being very thorough give all the explanations and then it a lot of times it's it doesn't matter I'm like people are asking me things and I'm like I've already I've like being like I don't know how to get people to read and I think there's a portion of it is that if a user doesn't want to read it doesn't matter if it's a hundred size font right in the center they're gonna look and then they're gonna click and then tell you that it's broken <laughs> Of course they are. It's very true. I mean, this is the same with like students at the university sometimes, no matter what you put on the syllabus, <laughs> like right in the center, and they'll still ask the same question. So I hear you. Yeah. So these are the first two. The third one that we're, everything's kind of ready to go. We're just waiting on some data collection is looking at it from a, a, a reviewer standpoint as well. So looking at um, like how many like we're, I guess, what is yeah. it? Uh, I got some stuff mm -hmm. to get sorted for folks. At eight yeah. Nine. And so this will be able to provide. So now you have the knowledge of how many contributors that you have active in certain parts of the code base, how many contributions are being done, and then how many different reviewers have been active on different sides of the code base. And so you can kind of see what your main an idea of like the of where a lot of this came from was being able to see the, the entire kind of development pipeline. So you can see how many reviewers do you have going on? How many reviewers do you have? So how many maintainer like personalities do you have on different sections? If that number is not high enough or it's like becoming a pretty, a problem, then you can now look at your contribution base as well and see, is there people who you might want to go reach out to and that could fulfill that role and might what you might want to see as like a community manager to give more opportunities to people who have been contributing a lot or have shown to kind of have the knowledge around the code base. And so I think all of all three of these are going to be really useful by themselves and kind of provide a pretty detailed picture of something that I, at least from my side, I've never seen um shown like data shown like this around repositories i have one completely unrelated question to everything that you have shown us yes it, one of the things that people want as don mentioned in a report is the ability to do comparisons across projects and i'm just mm -hmm. wondering if dash plotly 
has any, and I could Google this, but we're here, um, has any kind of framework for comparisons, like where yes. we might be able to do some, dem like um, do demonstrations of that kind of thing. And I'm not saying for you to do it. I mean, I'm thinking of projects for students, honestly. Um, the answer is yes and yes. If you're like, they're, to my knowledge, they're, like, we've thought about how to implement this and how to compare different like repositories and visualizations. The one that we already have that's nice to compare is the project velocity graph. I don't remember if I've showed this already in this, um, in this call. Um, but instead of grouping all of the repositories together, there are like this is one of probably the line of a couple of different visualizations that come that actually compare the different repositories within the same visualization. But what we're hoping to do, and this is a form of plot, or I don't even know if it's going to be, I guess this would be considered dash of like a button that you can pretty much split. And so you'd be able to see the two visualizations, like say for the example, this lottery factor. And so then you could select which repositories you wanted to go into the one view and the other one. And so that is a built-in um, dash plot like functionality, but we haven't been able to dive into it just yet. Yeah, and I feel like that's a hard problem. Um, everybody, I don't know, people always ask for that. Um, and then I'm always afraid, I'm almost afraid to give it to them because you can only compare projects that are similar to each other, right? You can't compare Kubernetes with um, with Augur, right? They're two fundamentally different things of fundamentally different sizes, and it just isn't a useful comparison. There are useful comparisons. So if you're comparing a number of things that are very, very similar, then that's that's fine. Um, but I, yeah, I, I struggle with this a little bit. Um, there's also a part of me that's like, just open eight knot in two different tabs and do a search bar on one of them and do a search bar on the other one. Yeah. And then look at them next to each other. I think a lot of people <laughs> want to compare large numbers of repositories with each other. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, yeah. And so the, in those cases, that's just super difficult to do. And when you would need to look at trying to do like a project velocity and maybe grouping, getting it down to maybe there's a couple that you want to look at yeah. next to each other. Um, Brian, uh, sorry, you have your hand up. Well, I I I kind of wonder if this is something that chaos should approach um, from a metric standpoint anyway, and talking about ecosystems, um, because for us, whenever this comes up, we're usually from a commercial aspect trying to compare two or three or four similarly related projects. So to pull examples out of the past, something like uh, Nutanix and then Overt, because those are both virtualization platforms. And we want to see their community activities there, regardless of size. Um, and that would be, just for one example, a very competitive uh, approach mm -hmm. um, to this. And I don't know if it's within the scope of chaos to start defining ecosystems like that or say like i i don't know i'm just spitballing out loud at this point but but yeah um we kevin. i mean kevin had his hand up uh yeah i'd like to add that the i mean it's not just uh it's not just about comparing projects to see how you're doing i think there's also a lot of aspirational comparison uh, a smaller project might want to compare itself to Kubernetes uh, because Kubernetes is a successful project. So you can you can look at those comparisons to kind of see what Kubernetes excels at and then model your own project after it. Uh, and then I would also add that it's not uh, it, it isn't just about comparing the project at large. Uh, there are certain activities that projects do where you can kind of zero in and make comparisons at a at a kind of finer grained. Uh, uh, level, even if the even if the projects themselves aren't uh, similar at a high level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good points, uh, Sophia. Um, I would just 
counter that I think is could be difficult for some group like Chaos to do this because someone has done this for an organization. We hand selected what we wanted to compare. <laughs> Uh, and when I say hand selected, say the group of repositories that we were considering. And I think I think that's sort of the feature component that I would like to see in our tooling is the ability to add your own custom groupings um, versus looking at everything by repository, given that when we look at, say, a project like Flutter, we're looking at all 32 repositories under the Flutter organization. So when we run a query, I'm going to include all of that. I'm not just going to look at the central one of like the central repositories. And even for a project like Kubernetes, I mostly look at Kubernetes, Kubernetes, but there's actually hundreds of other repositories associated with the project. So depending on the scope or focus of your analysis, you're gonna change what those groupings are anyway. And I think some of that is subjective, like for our own internal organization, I chose how to group various things when I was trying to present a comparative analysis. Um, so I think from a I don't know where this conversation started. I realize I'm interjecting like 30 minutes in. I just came from another session. Um, but I would love to see the ability for, say, like the user to customize. I want to see these five repos against these six repos and be able to basically build their own their own views and own groupings because it is going to be somewhat subjective based on what they want to know and what they're trying to achieve with it. Yeah. Yeah. I'll just, uh, that's kind of, it's why a big reason why we set up eight not the way that we have. And so that in a static sense, you can choose any number of, I guess at an organizational level, if you want to see Kubernetes, or you can see it as Kubernetes, Kubernetes, or any combination. And so you can see it, you can have a bunch of repositories if, or a combination of organizations or repositories, and you have the ability to log in and create your own user groups for the exact reason that you're saying, like, what people's lines between what you'd consider a Kubernetes ecosystem, for example, is going to be different. And so, and that might be like 30 plus repositories from five different orgs. And you want to see that consistently and not have to go and look it up and add it in and add it in. And so that's a big thing that we had worked on with Augur this past year on getting that Augur front end to be able to log in and be able to make our like user groups. Cool, that's awesome. Uh, Sean. I'll just add one one final thing here since I asked the comparison question initially. When we did have comparisons in Augur back before we gave up on NPM and Node and our front end, um, we did two things. One is people just created their own comparisons. They picked the repo. So it's kind of like buyer beware. Like you have to compare things to Sophia's point that you recognize as having something to do with each other and being reasonable comparisons. <laughs> Um, and the thing that we did that at least tried to overcome to some small degree the difference in scale of like an Augur and a Kubernetes is we we allowed people to do comparisons with a Z-score, um, which enables the, the user to see how the work cycles are similar, absent of scale. So if there's a like a release pattern, the shapes of the arrows or the bars or the lines, whatever, will be similar compressed by a Z-score so you can see workflow independent of work volume. Matt. So this is not related to comparisons. So um, mine is the tab you're showing right now, chaos. Mm -hmm. I might recommend you rename that to something because you have like contributions, contributors, affiliation, code base, and chaos is not as, like, like, I appreciate that. I'm guessing this is a, a nod towards chaos metrics, but it doesn't really, yeah. from a user perspective, they don't know necessarily. What's yeah. Under. And that's, and we'll probably start doing that with, we just wanted to make sure we had a tab and like some of, the, we have some visualizations we need to add to it. So then if all of these, like these two, for example, have come directly from a definition that chaos has written out. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so they're usually exist in multiple places. So then, yeah. um, but I would say that this is probably going to change into being more of where like a cha the chaos tab, I'm hoping to go more towards the, like representing the metrics models that, and try to start hosting some of those on eight knot as well. Just thinking then, like the way compass does it is they just put like a little, the little chaos circle, like mm -hmm. somewhere in the corner. Of oh, that's, I like that. That's yeah, cool. the, I, yeah, I think to Callie's point, the 
chaos metric models, like that's what I've had my students working on this semester. And I've got several decent examples of the starter health metric model built in 8-Knot that I'll share out some composite version of um, at the end of the semester. And I, I think some of the other metrics models, there's at least three others that are getting worked on by different groups. So yeah, that's, I think, I think the intention of that tab is just to represent the metric model specifically um, within 8-Knot. We would call it metric models, if not chaos, if that's problematic. Yeah, I like the idea of putting the chaos. I'm gonna, I'm gonna figure out how to put this on the cards because I think that's a better fit for a lot of the stuff we're doing. I just need to find a new home for project velocity because it doesn't fit under any of our tabs right now besides chaos, but that's a whole different thing. One thing I did also want to note because I forgot that this was a big update since the last time that I've shown anything was the GitHub bot filter. Um, now all of like pretty much you can turn it off if you would like to, but it's pretty much built into all of our visualizations that if it is identified by GitHub as a bot, which pretty much it's a user type. Now it's like different. People can build bots differently than it just being a user. If they're if they're older bots and somebody did just create a user to program to be a bot, that's not going to be identified by this. But it but any of the GitHub bots are now filtered out of all of our visualizations. And you can turn it off if you'd like, but it's there. And that was a big thing that we'd been working towards for a while. Sophia, I can't hear you, but I see your lips moving. Yeah. So the bot identity, it's been there for a while. Because like if you pull up, I can find an example. But whenever you look at like PRs or issues, you'll see a little like circular thing next to people, like a username where it says bot. And if you click on it, it's not a user. It's like a GitHub defined bot. And so this has been, that functionality has been there for a while. I just did, it just took a bit to figure out where that was on the API because it wasn't something that was ever as GitHub API can be sometimes. Um, it's very difficult to figure out where the oh. data is that you would possibly have. Yeah, because I was trying to find that also through the API and I've been struggling because I think I, I yeah. think it should be there. Um, it is. But I, I gave them that feedback that I couldn't find it in the API before. That's why I was curious how you found it. Um, but we can follow that off offline because that's, that's a personal project that I've been struggling with. I'll see if it's I can. It's really easy. I just need to, I'm, I'm literally scrolling up to through you and I's messaging, Sean, because I know that we, it's, yeah. once you see it, it's easy. They just don't, it's yeah. just on every user. And I um, think, I think probably to get, like, it's somewhere in the Augur code where we get contributors that that's just a field um, that gets called. So I don't know if I share, I don't know if we found the API together or if we navigated through yeah. Augur data, Kelly. That's, I just don't remember. We found the API. I thought okay. I was looking at the at the links because I had sent I, I know they add the little like bracket bot, which is how it looks on the username. Mm -hmm. But that's that's a very messy way of finding them. <laughs> it was a rant as as one does. There's a singular um, Stack Overflow post after many many months of like just every once in a while trying to go because github bot api are three of the most loaded terms that you could possibly put in the search bar so finding any <laughs> relevant information about yeah. this is incredibly difficult <laughs> can oh you God. share that post i'd love to oh yeah, yeah I thank you that. i appreciate uh, it Callie. yeah for sure it's super like i said once you see it you're like oh this is so easy why don't you document this <laughs> like yeah it's so simple <laughs> Like yeah. it was already in Augur. We just did, we we didn't even know that it was in Augur already. Yeah, and I've been capturing it for years, and I had no idea. That's how. <laughs> oh, Augur API, not Augur, but GitHub API. I feel like this is like a, I don't know. That's the the Wizard of Oz. You had your solution all along. Yeah, and that was in the data. <laughs> But yeah, so if you collect any user, like if you just do any like any of the user dumps, it's just pretty much just the field in the same way that username is a field. That's cool. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so we have four more minutes left in oh, yeah. 
Interesting. Do you have anything quick to share as a last point or should we transition to Sean to talk about the GraphQL API? We can transition to said if anybody has any comments, questions, suggestions here or in the open an issue on 8 not all feedback is really appreciated. And I will give you the feedback that I promised you at LF Member Summit. If I don't get to it this week, it will definitely be next week when we have no chaos meetings and I'll have more time. But I, I promise I will do that. My updates are really brief. The deployed versions of Augur do now include a GraphQL API, but you have to ask me for use because we haven't created the token system yet. And if I don't provide tokens, then it's just way too wide open. Uh, compared to a regular RESTful API. Um, and then there's a, now a project under Augur where I've created issues for each of the chaos metrics um, for which there can or should be a uh, an Augur endpoint. And right now I'm going through and carefully identifying which ones have endpoints that need to be have their links updated and which ones simply need to have endpoints created. And so... That's where that's at. That's the whole thing right there. Awesome. Thank you. And there is an Augur meeting tomorrow. At... Yes. It, uh, what is it? Is it the four or the seven? I always have to look at my calendar. It's the, it's the one I can attend. So the, the 7 a.m. one. The it's earlier. time. The yeah, 7 a.m. Central. Yeah. I will see you all there. <laughs> Cool. Uh, awesome. So our next meeting is in January. So we can continue to talk in the Slack channel. Um, yeah, I think uh, I think we're good. I'll miss seeing all of you during our meeting for weeks, but I will love actually having time to do more work. So that's that's good too. And hope everybody enjoys your holidays. Right on. Happy holidays, y'all. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Happy holidays. Bye.